Welcome everyone. I am so excited that you're joining with us today. My name is Andrew and I'm the lead pastor of The Crossing Church and today we are continuing our series, Bless, where we are looking at how to live as a blessing to those around us. Today is a special week as we get a chance to hear from our teaching pastor, Nicole, as she talks about one of my favorite topics of all time. On top of that, stick with us to the very end because I'm so excited to introduce you to a brand new staff member and friend who is joining the Crossing team. And if you find today helpful, make sure you like, share, and subscribe to our pages. Thanks again, everyone. Hey there, I'm Nicole. Thanks for being here. So just a warning, today we are talking about food. So go grab a snack if you are going to need one and eat while you are here with me. And while you get settled, I have a couple questions for you to think about. Food is one of my favorite topics of conversation. What is one of your favorite meals to make? And where do you love to go out to eat? So I'll start with a confession. In our family, we don't love to cook but we do enjoy grilling. So some good friends of ours taught us how to grill pizzas and our lives have never been the same. It's an activity and a meal because it's involved and messy and everyone can make something unique. And it starts conversations and it helps you get to know people. So grilled pizzas is one of our favorite meals to make. And where do I love to go out to eat? Well, thank you for asking. I do love to eat out. I love the atmosphere. I love different styles of food. And sometimes you just want someone else to make you a really good burger. And so my new favorite place is The Cut. There's one in Irvine here in Orange County. I could eat one of their original burgers and fries any day. Today, right now. I'd go right now if I could. And I find that when you eat a burger, it makes you think of other burgers. And then you get to have fun ranking them and comparing them and remembering them. Food is not a rational or objective thing, right? It is wrapped up in our memory, our culture, our habits, our health, our cravings, our identity, basically. Food is a window into someone's life. And our relationship to food is both unique and universal. One of the best or most annoying things about life, depending on who you are, is that a couple times a day, we all have to stop what we are doing and eat. And God could have made us differently when it comes to food. For example, we could eat way less often. Did you know emperor penguins go three months without eating? Or Komodo dragons, they eat like one big meal a month and then the rest of the time they're just snacking. We could just eat for utility, but most of us don't. We eat for pleasure, for fun, interest, adventure, delight, taste. We have 10,000 taste buds for a reason. Food is life. I love this quote. The main facts in human life are five. Birth, food, sleep, love, and death. We are in a series called Bless. We are talking about a new way to share our faith, one that has everything to do with how we love and bless the people God has placed in our lives. Last week, we talked about listening with care. And this week, we are talking about eating together. Listening and eating, combine these two things and you will build relationships. You will share life and really bless people. We start with listening because Eating is unique to each person. The way you eat is not the way the person next to you eats. And when we learn to listen with care and eat together, eating together becomes a way to get to know each other deeply rather than a way to make someone be like us. Jesus blessed people by eating with them, listening to them, and talking with them. Sometimes he provided the food. Sometimes he was invited to a party. Eating was central to Jesus's ministry of loving others and showing God's love to the world. Here's just a couple examples. Jesus's first miracle is at a wedding, turning water into wine in John 2. In the countryside, he feeds 5,000 people with a couple of fish and bread in John 14. He uses a dinner as a major way to teach his disciples how to remember him. We call it the Last Supper from Luke 22. With his disciples on the beach, Jesus eats a picnic after his resurrection in John 21. 
In the book of Luke alone, there are 10 stories of Jesus eating with people. Jesus is basically either on his way to eat with people, eating with people, or just leaving a meal with people. Jesus is always eating. When I told my husband this fact, he said, oh, that makes sense. It's like in a sci-fi movie when the special being has to prove that they're human. A robot doesn't eat. An angel probably wouldn't eat. An alien usually can't eat human food. So Jesus is eating all the time in a way to say, hey, this guy is human. You're going to learn that he is God too, but he is human through and through. Look how much this guy eats. And just so you know, when you eat, you are like Jesus. He eats with people so often that Jesus says of himself, the son of man, which is one of his favorite names for himself, came eating and drinking. He says that in Luke 7. Don't you love that? Jesus describes how he came to the earth party. He says, I came eating and drinking. God created us to eat as a regular daily part of our life. So it makes sense that the God who created food would love food and use it to teach us about himself and how to love people. It also makes sense that the God who made us and food would eat with people all the time. Part of why Jesus came to earth was to be human, to know our pain and joy and struggle, to live like we live and to know us. It's part of why we can trust him, this God who was also human. And Jesus shows us that he ate with people in order to fulfill his purpose and love them. Eating together has incredible blessings and benefits and purpose. Here are four of them. Eating together grows our faith. Our ability to appreciate and be satisfied by food is pretty faith building. Here's what I mean. I have felt my own faith grow through amazing meals. Do you know what I mean? Like when food is so good, God has to be real. Like how can life be an accident when this meal exists? Those kinds of meals have grown my faith. I remember meals that were so good, they almost make you cry and laugh and pray. Our friends Norm and Sherry and Lehua have an appreciation and skill with food beyond my own imagination. So it's so good and they are so generous. And when we eat together, I feel so loved by them and by God that my faith is renewed. When they invite us to dinner, it is like going to church. Eating together provides for us. As a culture with available food, it's hard for us to understand what it's like to not know where your next meal will come from. Jesus lived in a time and a place where food was not always easy. Making bread took hours. Eating meat was a very special occasion. So someone sharing food was literally life-giving, not just delicious or nice. But we today, we all have moments where food is scarce or difficult, right? Some of us, even more than others, know what this feels like. Can you remember a time when you ate only because someone else gave you food or made you a meal? Maybe it was elementary school when you forgot your lunch and a friend shared theirs with you. Or there was a time when my husband and I were both incredibly sick, like the sickest we've ever been. And our friend Michael gave us a huge, like huge pot of chicken soup and a bucket of homemade Mexican rice. And our family basically, especially our kids, lived off of that for like two days, three days. Or yesterday, I didn't bring any food to work. And Carol and Steve Sandoval from The Crossing in Espanol had brought homemade empanadas to our planning meetings. And I was here all day and the only reason I ate was because of them. Eating together also educates us. So here's another confession. When I told my kids that I was teaching about the value of eating together, they said, um, have you told anyone that you're not the best person to do that? And I laughed because no, I didn't. My kids know eating is complicated in our little family. From my lack of cooking skills to sensory issues, to severe allergies. We have a lot of limitations between the four of us when it comes to food and eating together. So we're not a family that sits down to eat a big common meal every night and it's all just easy for us. 
No, for us, we have to know each other really well when it comes to food. And we have to get creative about what and how we eat and spend time together. So we might try new recipes knowing they could turn out bad. And we all end up eating our separate things and talking in the kitchen. Or we might all have snack dinners while playing Uno. So what I told my kids is that I do actually think I'm a great person to talk about eating together, exactly because it's not straightforward or easy for our family. And you may have a complicated relationship with food. My hope is that by the end of this time, you understand the values that make eating together important, and we can find creative ways to live those values in your unique life. Eating together helps you get to know someone, their culture, their health needs, their limitations, their preferences. It's not about fitting some cookie cutter image of a dinner party. It's about sharing life and the unique way each person needs to eat is central to their life. As we are patient and curious and supportive and committed to each other's thriving through food and other ways, we get to know each other on deeper levels. Just like Jesus, we are human with cells that need food, or we are also souls that are affected by our bodies. Our bodies are vulnerable. We like to hide that we have any weaknesses. And eating together exposes some of our weaknesses. We get a chance to love each other in that. Eating together is not always simple, but it is insightful. Which leads to one more purpose we'll talk about for a bit through Jesus' story. Eating together affirms acceptance. It's hard for us to understand what it meant to eat with someone in Jesus' time. It was a statement of approval, friendship, rightness, cleanliness. Who you ate with indicated who you loved and considered a part of your social class. It was truly scandalous and had consequences that lasted for days or even weeks when a rabbi chose to eat with non-Jewish people or people who were labeled sinners and outside of the correct social group. We all know, even now, what it feels like when you are included and invited and welcomed and accepted. And that is a blessing. In Luke 5, Jesus is early in his ministry. He's meeting people and, of course, then eating with them. And Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus calls Levi to follow him. Levi is a tax collector. So he is someone who, for whatever reason, has chosen out of a God-following religious life. He makes his living collecting money for the Roman Empire and then demanding more on top of that for himself. Tax collectors and sinners is a phrase that you will see in the Bible a lot. Basically, it's the people who either by choice, family upbringing, race, circumstances, they are not part of the church people. They've either opted out or been excluded. Jesus didn't accept that invitation to Levi's house just because he was hungry. When the religious leaders asked why he was eating with these people, he answers, I came to call sinners to repentance. Now, that's one of those phrases that gets used as a weapon and turned all around. So listen, that phrase, sinners to repentance, it means I am calling people who do not follow God to change their minds and follow him now because there is a clear picture of who God is in me, Jesus. That God you thought you knew, the one of the Pharisees, the one of weird rules or judgment or hierarchy, that God who has a system where you will never be good enough or included, that is not the God Jesus represents. For Jesus, no one is excluded and everyone is invited to rethink their life to change direction, to get curious, to put their faith in Jesus. And this is good news for us, for our family and friends and coworkers and neighbors as we learn to share our faith. We're not 
demanding people live to an impossible standard or accept some religious doctrine that will never actually fit them anyway. We are, through our stories, our lives, our shared experiences, asking them to rethink life now that they're starting to get to know Jesus. When you eat with people, are you so loving, authentic, and interested in their lives and who they are that they feel understood, that they open up and can easily see the role of Jesus in your life? Because the kinds of stories Jesus told when he was with these tax collectors and sinners were stories of each individual mattering to God. The lost, the ones who feel forgotten, the one who thinks who thought nobody noticed them anymore, the one who had been far from God but wants to come close. In Luke 15, Jesus is at yet another dinner party eating with sinners, but of course the Pharisees are still nearby questioning Jesus' behavior. And here we've got a couple stories that Jesus tells for all of them to hear. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. So in this story, a sheep wanders off. Maybe some of the people at that party had wandered off of their own choices. Maybe some of us have wandered off by our own choices. And now they are found. We can be found. Jesus goes on. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. A coin in this story, a coin gets lost because something happens to it. Someone knocks it down. Someone misplaces it. Maybe some of the people at that party didn't choose to be far from God, but they were, and now they get to be found. And maybe that's true of us. We didn't choose to be far from God, but now we have a choice to be found. Because to Jesus, he was not looking at these people as tax collectors and sinners. He was seeing people who God loves and treasures and rejoices over. When you eat together with people, especially people who do not know God, for whatever reason, our goal should be the same as Jesus, to let them know they matter to God, that whenever they decide to change their minds on God and start pursuing a relationship with him, there will be so much rejoicing. There is so much rejoicing when we go from closed off to God to open to him. There is so much rejoicing when we go from changing our minds on God not existing, not caring, being too confusing, and we change our minds and say, I'm going to get to know him. I'm going to be curious. I'm going to follow him. When we say yes to him, there is rejoicing. Eating together is how Jesus spent time with people, and it's how we can too. To eat together is to live, to nourish and care for each other, to say, I will share with you. I like you. I accept you. If Jesus did this all the time, and if we are Jesus' followers, we need to be eating with people. So what excuses stop us from eating with people, and what are some creative ways that we can do this that play to our different strengths? Here are six quick excuses we end up using that stop us from eating with other people. Number one, I don't like having people over to my house. I get that. I live in a small house with a family of introverts. When we are home, we like to be quiet and rest. So here's how we handle it. Go out, go get coffee, go for a walk, bring food to work or to school to share. That favorite restaurant you thought about at the beginning, go there. 
And when people do go to your house, set a start and an end time for meals at your own house. It is okay to set boundaries that still honor what God is calling us to. Excuse number two, my house really isn't nice enough. Listen, if you want to have people over, but you are worried about how nice or not nice your house is, shake it off. Try to let that go. The power of eating together is not in the niceness of your house. It's in being together and providing for each other. Excuse number three, I can't afford to pay for everything. Who says you have to pay for everything or that it has to be expensive? Invite a friend to go get ices at Circle K. Or say yes when someone invites you to their house for dinner. Meet someone for a cup of tea at Starbucks and get refills. Excuse number four, I won't know what to say. Okay, so I'm going to share a cheat with you. This started on family road trips. Again, like I said, we're introverts. We don't always know what to talk about. So I have bookmarked websites with questions on them. I have a book with questions in it that has like 3,000 questions to ask your friends. I keep a note in my phone with hundreds of good questions to ask. Prepare questions, and then you just ask a follow-up question. You don't need to worry about how conversation is going to flow. You can actually prepare for it. Excuse number five. I don't have time. We are made to eat regularly. You are going to eat. You're going to need to get a snack. So pick one meal a week when you would need to eat anyway and invite someone to join you. Which leads to the last one and one I talked about in regards to my own family. Excuse number six. Food is complicated for me. I don't know your exact situation, but I do understand. Here are some ways that we do this. Without shame or apology, we are clear about what we can and can't do. Then we invite people in anyway. Maybe we go to the green belt behind our house and we try the fresh tomatoes that our neighbor is growing. Or we all make a new recipe knowing that only a few of us will eat it and everyone else will eat something else. Or we'll sample new foods rather than making whole meals. We spend time together and allow people to eat or not depending on their own needs. The heart of what Jesus was doing as he ate with all kinds of people was affirming their goodness and humanity as he affirmed his own. The need to eat at all is vulnerable. It's a vulnerability of being human. How each of us eats is then another level of intimacy and love as we accept each other. What can you do that involves your body and your attention together? Go for a walk or a run together build something together, try different kinds of lemonade, eat what you can together. There are options. And if food is not complicated for you, this is your wake-up call, that food is not easy for everyone, and you can really serve people. Side note, next week's message is about how to serve people really well. You can serve people by being aware and supportive of their nutritional needs. So here's your challenge. Be like Jesus. Eat with someone who does not know God. Pick one meal or snack this week and invite someone that you are praying will put their faith in Jesus to do it with you. Author and Bible scholar N.T. Wright says, when Jesus himself wanted to explain to his disciples what his forthcoming death was all about, he didn't give them a theory. He gave them a meal. At the Last Supper, Jesus used food everyday food, to explain what he was doing. Through his death, Jesus becomes life, our source of life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Now, that doesn't mean we don't eat. Jesus was the bread of life, and yet he came eating and drinking. But eating and drinking is a way to be reminded constantly about Jesus. I don't want you to just think about Jesus at church or when we take official communion together. I want you to think about Jesus every time you eat and to see eating as an opportunity to share your faith, affirm the goodness of humanity of people, and be like Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for food. Thank you for the way that we have this thing that every day we have to do. And it gives us joy And it also is a way to get to know each other's vulnerabilities and to build trusting relationships. God, I pray for everyone listening that they would reach out to one person this week 
someone who does not know you, and just invite them to go eat. And that we would be in those conversations the same way you were in those conversations, getting to know people, talking about how much they matter, how much they matter to us as a starting point, and that it matters that they were willing to give up some time and come and eat with us. And then as time goes on, that we'd be willing to speak honestly about your role in our lives and also honestly about how much each person matters to you, Jesus. Thank you for how you rejoice over every single individual person who changes their mind and says, I want to believe in you. Jesus, thank you that you love us in these really practical, tangible ways for the benefits of eating together. And I just pray that you help us have eyes to see the way we use excuses to avoid this thing that you did all of the time and you are asking us to do as well. Thank you for this day and for this church. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. She never fails me And all my days I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head And I will sing Of the goodness of God
thank you so much, Nicole, for that great message. Well, today I am so excited to introduce our brand new grow pastor, Omar. We've gotten a chance to know each other over the last few weeks, and I gotta tell you, our church is incredibly fortunate to have someone who is so passionate about their family, about their faith, and helping people grow. So Omar, thanks so much for being with us today. Well, my name is Omar Garcia, and I'm the new grow pastor here at The Crossing, and Andrew asked me to take a moment and share a little bit about my story and my background. I was born in Caracas, Venezuela in 1984, and I moved to Las Vegas at the age of six years old with my mother and my brother. During my high school years, I was involved in a ministry called Young Life, shout out to Young Life, and I was invited by a neighbor during my freshman year, but the gospel message didn't hit me until my senior year when my best friend at the time came back from Young Life camp completely on fire for Jesus and invited me to church. That Sunday, I offered and completely surrendered my life over to Jesus, and I was on fire for the Lord and became a Young Life leader and started leading high schoolers to Jesus. While I was leading, I met my wife, Allie. And Allie and I have been married for 14 years, and we have four kids. Mila, who's seven, Jude, who's five, Caleb, who's three, and Stella, who's nine months old. Then the Lord started opening up doors and called me into ministry. And I started working for a church in Henderson, Nevada, just outside of Las Vegas. I was there for about eight years before, before God called me into ministry in Corona, California, where I served for four years at a church called Crossroads Christian Church. And now the Lord opened up doors for my family and I to become part of the crossing. I love it. Omar, so glad to have you and your family here. Tell us like a few fun facts about you guys. A fun fact about me is that I learned to serve last year and I haven't stopped since. And another fun fact about me is that my family and I are obsessed with Disney. We just got our passes recently and cannot wait to run into some of you at the park. My wife, Allie, and I could not be more excited for what God is doing here at The Crossing. We knew the moment that we set our feet on this campus that this was where God was calling us. We are so thankful for you, Andrew and Bruce and the entire staff for making us feel so loved and welcomed. And to everyone at the church, we cannot wait to meet you each and every one of you. Well, you know what? We are so excited as well, Omar, and we're so excited how God is gonna use you and your family and just what he has in store in this next season. You know, one of the best things about The Crossing is the people. It's why we have small groups where you can grow in your faith. It's why we emphasize our kids and student ministries so they can get connected in age-specific ministries. And it's why on October 6th, we're doing a date night here on campus. We know that this past year has added a lot of strain to relationships, from couples worrying about finances to stress about children and online schooling to the worry and anxiety we've all felt there is so much each and every one of us is dealing with. So one of the things that we've decided to do is create some space right here on our campus for a date night. We've picked a great movie called The Princess Bride, and we're gonna have tacos and some really fun activities planned for the kids. Our student ministries will be meeting on campus that night, so if you have kids, we have an incredible night planned for them. That will include food and bounce houses. So if you live in the Orange County area, we encourage you to sign up in advance at thecrossing.com slash fall and bring some friends with you. On top of that, we're just a few weeks away from Halloween. And what that means is it is just a few weeks away from one of my favorite events on our campus, Halloween Weekend. You see, every year we turn our campus into the best Halloween experience for kids possible. We have everyone dress up, we have fun games, balloon animals, face painting, and so much more. And on top of that, we have a ton of candy. Like we have a literal ton of candy we give out. So I wanna ask two things of you. First, I wanna ask each one of you to donate at least one bag of great candy. I'm talking great candy. I'm talking like the kind of candy kids would get excited about. Twix, Reese's, Milky Ways, the good stuff. And I want you to mark your calendar for Halloween weekend on our campus and begin making some invites. Now, one last note before we end our time together. I wanna to say thank you to all of you who give to The Crossing. You should know the only reason we can produce the content we do online week in and week out is because of those of you who have chosen to step up and give. So today, if you've been watching us for a few weeks now, I want to encourage you to decide today to contribute financially. You can do that by going to thecrossing.com forward slash give and make your first ever gift today. Even the gift of $25 makes a huge impact. Well, everyone, we are so glad you're with us. Thanks so much for joining with us today. See you soon. See you guys.